Have any of you heard the passage that Dean read? Raise your hand if you've just heard that Bible story before. A couple of you? Someone who has their hands raised, what did you know about that? When he started to read that, what did you remember? What wisdom is there? Why in the world would that be a Christmas reading? Someone tell me. There was a prophecy involved? Who said that? Someone's embarrassed to have a right answer. There you go. Yeah, there was a prophecy involved. Absolutely. What, what else? What about that passage kind of resonates with you or means something? You're going to have to hear it again, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, well, tell me then. Who here has never heard that passage before? A bunch of you. Okay, well, let's, I, then you be ready to answer for the ones who've heard it and don't remember what it says. Here we go. I'm going to read it, of course, from a different translation because that's what I do. Um, John the Baptist, who was in prison heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah? Really? Really? Are you, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for somebody else? And Jesus told them, go back to John. Tell him what you've heard. Tell him what you've seen. The blind, they see. The lame, they walk. Those with leprosy, they're cured. The deaf, they're hearing. The dead are raised to life. The good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. But let's just stop on that little part. Whether you've heard this story a million times or this is the first time, why is that a Christmas story? Oh, you're, you're, so you're echoing the Hebrews passage of faith is uh, what, you can, what you believe without seeing? Okay. What else, Barbie? People are getting good gifts. Those, those are great gifts to get. Those are the kind of gifts I wish we could all ask for, right? So there's some gifts in there, some Christmas. What else? Well, it reiterates hope also. It does. A lot of these end up having the, some of the same messages we can, we can tease out, but it does. It reiterate, reiterates hope for a lot of those people. Um, is there Christmas in prison? Has anyone ever been to prison in Christmas time to go see? I mean, that must be a bleak kind of time. Maybe he's offering some hope to that. Uh, I study this stuff. I study Bible stuff. I study theology. And sometimes that gets me on all these, these, these high ideas. Well, today I'm going to take all those out, and I'm going to focus on exactly what Jesus didn't say, which is almost Zen, isn't it? To figure out what this passage means by what Jesus doesn't say. You probably know, especially during Christmas, that Jesus quotes the Old Testament all the time. All the time. Those were Jewish scriptures, and Jesus was? Yeah, exactly. Next week after church, we get to learn about Judaism in there with some of our neighbors. Uh, in these verses particularly, Jesus is referring to a pile of things that Isaiah said. Now, Isaiah was a Jewish prophet about 600 years before him, who basically, this is my summary, you can read in your own Bibles in the introduction what Isaiah was about, but in my summary, Isaiah had three ideas that were kind of fresh ideas or a fresh take on old ancient wisdom. And maybe these will sound so obvious to you, if they're really obvious to you, then he did a good job of starting these ideas, because every idea, someone has to have it first, and I think Isaiah was first on some of this. So, I think Isaiah was the first person to work out, so, so A, God called the Hebrew people specially and first. Like we, they, they knew that. We all knew that. B, God created all people and everything. Obviously, everyone was like, yeah, sure, Isaiah, we all know that. C, God is love. Uh, duh, Isaiah. So then Isaiah put A, B, and C all together, and he came up with D. Well, maybe that means God loves everybody. Like Jews and non-Jews. Like sinners and saints. And Jesus said, yes, absolutely, that's my point. That's my point right there. God loves everybody. And Paul, who comes after Jesus, he says, absolutely. And he starts crafting this new way of being faithful based on how Jesus explained God's universal love. And even if some Christians today get stuck on A, B, and C, and they can only land like A, B, and C, God only loves mm, some people some of the time, we are called to keep saying yes to the idea that God loves everybody. Amen? Amen. All right, second, his second realization. Because of the first one, Isaiah was constantly talking about how to treat people, especially people who are typically not loved by society. People who are oppressed, people who are poor, hurting, sick, in trouble for all sorts of reasons. So he said, okay, we, we, on D, God loves all people, really, all of them. And he said, well, E, we should all follow God, right? Yeah, okay, right, we're good on that. So F, that means we should love all people, hmm. which means, G, we should especially care for those who need love the most. Oh, that, 
That was a new idea at one point. Can you believe that? It seems so obvious. And he even went further and said, H, maybe that means we should stop letting powerful people and systems of the world run over women's and orf- women and orphans and foreigners and homeless and the disabled. Maybe we should support them especially. And Jesus said, absolutely, yes, 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 yes. And Paul said, yes. And so Paul slapped right in the middle of the new movement, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, all are one in Jesus Christ. And those old ideas, though, they just keep sneaking in. and They keep sneaking in and saying, God loves them, but not those. And even if God did love those, let God love them. We don't have to love them. What are we supposed to do? Which is junk. So we have to keep saying yes to doing God's love. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm on a roll, so I'm ready for the third one. <laughs> okay, the third one, Isaiah figured. If God loves all people and wants us especially to care for those who need love the most... Well, this is crazy. This is outlandish. It'll never catch on. There's just too many people with power to ever let this work. And not only is the system broken, but we're kind of sometimes pretty messy too. So the only way this whole loving and doing thing is going to possibly work, let's see, if A, B, C, D, E, A, G, I can't even do the alphabet anymore, but H, if if H is true, but doing that is really, really hard. Well, Isaiah said, maybe, maybe God will send us someone to show us how to do it. 600 years before Jesus, Isaiah said, I think if all that's true, God's going to send us someone to bring good news to the poor, to cure diseases, to be a friend of the friendless, to release those who are imprisoned. In fact, what we're going to say is God's going to anoint. He's going to pour oil over the head of that person. And in Hebrew, that word is Messiah, the anointed one. In Greek, the same word is Christ, the anointed one. So maybe God will anoint someone to do all this stuff and show us how to do it. And Jesus said, yes, exactly, that's me. And Paul said, that's him. And so this new expression of faith in the world, through the letters that Paul wrote, through the Gospels that came after Paul, it kept pointing back to Jesus over and over. That's the anointed one. There so that we remember and that we know how to do this. So then hundreds of years later, the church said, you know, I think we need a reminder, a constant reminder of this anointed one and how to do this love. Let's have a mass. Let's have a special worship service on, mm, like, Christ's day to celebrate the idea that God really anointed someone. Christmas. (coughs) And a few decades ago, part of the church that's assigned to, that picks the scriptures that are assigned to us, they wanted to figure out how to remind ourselves to be loving and do love. So they picked that scripture that Dean read a couple minutes ago. We read that passage about John asking if Jesus, are you the anointed one? John asks, Jesus, are you the one sent to bring good news to the poor and cure the sick and be a friend of the friendless and release the prisoners? And Jesus said, yes. no, yes. no. <laughs> You missed something there. (laughs) Remember, I'm focusing on what Jesus didn't say, not what he did say. Jesus actually said to John, sort of, kind of. You're almost there. You almost got the idea, but eh, mm. you want some gift, but not quite. See, in all other places of the gospel, everywhere else, that Jesus quotes Isaiah in this whole list of things uh, that the Messiah is supposed to do in this whole list of good news and freeing and healing. Jesus quotes this whole cool list of what the anointed one will do to bring God's love to all the people. And he says, look, we're doing it. It must, must be happening. But when John the Baptist, while sitting in prison, asks, are you the anointed one that's going to do that whole list of cool things that Isaiah said and that you've been doing? Jesus starts his Messiah resume. Okay, good news, yep, healing, yep, loving, yep. You should see what we're doing out here. It's looking great, John. But that prison-releasing thing, did John get out of prison? No. John died in prison. John was asking Jesus for a gift to release from prison, and Jesus said, not today. It's going to be good for them. Joy is going to be hard for you right now. And John said, well, Merry Christmas to you, cousin. Thanks for nothing. Now, I want to make sure you get this, because this isn't isn't the most obvious scriptural passage here that I'm doing here. For the reading assigned for us to prepare for Christmas, I didn't pick this one, the big church picked it. The most remarkable thing about it, to me, this is the part I do pick, is that Jesus does not give John what he wants. Does not give John the gift that he wants. Hence, thanks for nothing. Thanks for nothing. Is that a prayer? It's been my prayer a lot lately. Some of you have had that prayer a lot lately. God, thanks for nothing. 
You said you were going to proclaim good news, but all I see is oppression everywhere I turn. You said you were going to bind up the wounds, but all I see is depression and cancer. You said you were here to give new life, but I see death on death. You said you were here to unlock people from their prisons, but I see addiction everywhere. You said you were here to bind broken hearts, but broken. Thanks for nothing. I think sometimes Christians get so caught up with this imagery of Jesus as just some divine Santa Claus. God wants me to be happy. This will make me happy. So instead of sitting on a big fat man's lap, I'm going to kneel to a skinny man's cross. Dear Mr. Jesus, here's my Christmas list, and it's all good gifts. It's all good gifts we're asking for. I want redemption. I want patience. I want comfort. I want love. I want acceptance. Could you get me the job that I want so I can support my family? Could you maybe fix that relationship that is just a struggle that just brings darkness over everything when that comes together? I don't really want to exercise more, but I need some health, God, and maybe a little luck in the lottery wouldn't be so bad. (laughs) And you know, God, that I've been good. I have my naughty days, but I come to church at least like once or twice a, a, a month or a season. So thank you, God, and amen, and I'm waiting for the things that I want. Where's my healing? Where's my joy? Where's my peace? I asked so nice. Thanks for nothing, God. But of course, God and Santa Claus are not the same. And not getting what we ask for, what we pray for, what we desperately want, even what we deserve, not getting that, um, that that which makes us happy, is not the end of the story. Jesus knows, Jesus reminds us that sometimes life is just hard. Sometimes pain is going to come. Sometimes you will cry and you won't stop. Sometimes you will get what you deserve. Sometimes you'll get far, far, far worse than you'll deserve. All that is true. And Jesus tells us, my favorite verse in the Bible, in this world there will be trouble. He promises us that. And he says, but take heart for I overcome the world. I don't believe that verse all the time, but it's still my favorite because it's what I want to believe all the time. And that's not to discount any of our troubles, any of our brokenheartedness, any of our grief. It's also to lift up the fact that good news pervades all things. The hardness that happened to you, the unfair things that are happening to you, that stuff is wrong. So you going to fix it, God? No, not today. Are you going to heal me? Not yet. Why not? Ah, now that's progress. Why not? I can't be entirely sure in today's story when he was responding to John why Jesus skipped that central part of his Messiah resume. My guess, which is consistent with everything else I know about God, my guess is that Jesus just didn't want to be Santa Claus. My guess is that Jesus does not want us thinking that God is only worth our attention when life feels good or that when we want something. My guess is that Jesus would prefer us to have and develop a real deep joy, a perspective on the world, from which, from our vantage point, rather than just simple ease and happiness, we can find the good even when we're overwhelmed with the bad. My guess is that Jesus wants to bring us comfort through each other, through our friends and loved ones. Jesus wants us to be the new life for us to break the chains. Jesus wants us to find joy in one another, especially when it is most hard to find when we are alone and sometimes have an empty soul. You know the old saying, if you're a hammer, every problem is a nail? I think, my guess is, Jesus is saying here, reminding us, that if you see through a lens of joy, everything you see can be joy, even around those dark corners, even through tears, even when battles are lost. Now, the other three words of Advent, we got peace and love are coming up. Hope, peace, and love, according to the ancient church, this is their, their system. We contemplate those three gifts, those three nouns, the holy men and women that shape the vision of the church, of, of faith. They pick those three, hope and peace and love, as things we contemplate on. But joy, when the ancient church put this together, the uh, Latin word is gaudete, gaudete which is not a noun, it is a verb. And more specifically, it is an imperative. And so the other three weeks that we come to this church and and celebrate our God, we are called to trust these three nouns. But this week, we are called to go be joyful. Go share joy. 
Don't wait for someone to, to bring it to you, to make you happy or sad. But go be joyful. No matter your situation, find your joy with each other. And you will find the good news of Christmas with you. It ain't easy. But friends, whatever life has given you or not given you, whatever loss you have suffered or not, whatever blessings you have received or not, whatever prayer has been answered or not, may you reach, may you reach for a joyful perspective that underlies all things. May you hold on to the joy that shapes gratitude. May you share in rejoicing with your neighbors and by so doing, honor the one who came to show us how to love. Amen, and let's sing the first three verses of I Come With Joy. Thank you.